Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. We're thrilled to have Sarah Ayub with us here today. Sarah, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? So, I'm a graduate student at the National Cyclotron Laboratory at MSU, National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory. I am getting my PhD in nuclear physics, specifically nuclear astrophysics. And I'm an experimental physicist, which means that instead of your idea of a physicist sitting down, scribbling equations and solving things, I'm more doing things with my hands. I'm building things, testing things. So that's basically what I do. You talked about how you build things. Can you give us a couple of examples of previous projects that you worked on at the Cyclotron Lab? So the biggest project I'm working on right now is called SACAR. It's the separator for capture reactions. It's kind of like a beamline. If you've ever taken a tour of the NSCL or FRIB, you can see that it's a collection of magnets and vacuum systems. And what I've been building, so for example, we start by building the actual vacuum system itself. So you can imagine just a bunch of pipes connected to turbo pumps, and we have to just pump down the entire pipeline so that there's vacuum inside those pipes. So that is a little bit more difficult than you would imagine We spend an extended amount of time trying to get vacuum in our system. So then we're just assembling it, trying to make sure there are no leaks. If there are leaks, it takes a while to find them. So this is one example of something that we build. And then the actual design in in my project, the actual design of the separator wasn't my design myself, but we've been assembling it. And so we end up building a lot of the components together and testing them, make sure that they all work together. That sounds really great, but I was wondering if we could please take a step back over here. You mentioned a beamline, and some children that are listening and other people might not understand what a beamline is. Can you please explain a little bit about that? So one way I like to imagine the cyclotron is just imagine a flowing river. And you know how the water in the river is just flowing inside um, a body of land under it. So imagine that land is actually a pipe, just like the pipes that the water in your house runs through. So imagine that pipe starting from a source where we have particles coming in instead of a river. So imagine like a laser beam, the lasers you play with with your cat, for example. Imagine that going up through a pipe and flowing like a river and kind of bending left and right depending on where you want it to go. But that laser has to be somewhere where there's no particles in the air, so it has to be under vacuum. So that's what we call a beam line under vacuum. So it's like a system where these laser particles, laser looking particles flow through and go to certain places where we run our experiments. Why does the beam line have to be under a vacuum in the first place? Well, we are studying some fundamental reactions that these particles are having with very specific things. And the actual atmosphere around you, while you might not see anything in it, there's a lot of particles around you that are so small that your eye can't see them. But small particles would actually see them because they're the same size and they would end up hitting so many things and we would just lose our entire beam within the first two seconds of emitting it. So we want to make sure that it gets transported from the beginning all the way down and that is actually like several kilometers length. So what does this beam do? What do you guys do with the beam? So that actually depends on who you ask in the lab. So there are kind of two separate things you can do with it. One is called a high energy study and one is more low energy study. So the difference between those two is that you can imagine if you throw two things at each other with a lot of force, it's going to break it. But if you try to slowly push them together, it's sort of going there. Imagine Play-Doh, there's gonna, they're going to stick together. So those are the two different things you can do with a beam of particles. So some people, like my friends, work on high energy studies where they actually shoot these particles on some target. It depends on what they want to study, made of different things. And then they, they break apart the nuclei that, uh, of these particles that they're shooting. And when they do that, they can learn more things about the structure of the nuclei. Well, what my group does is we work at lower energy where we want, instead of breaking them, to fuse them together. So, for example, the device I'm working on will add a proton. So if you go back to uh, high school chemistry... You remember that the atom is made of an electron orbiting a nucleus made of protons and neutrons. So what we study is just a nucleus, so just the protons and neutrons. And what I'm studying is how we can add a proton to an already existing nucleus. So that makes up a whole new element. So we're basically creating new elements using a target. And at low energies, when it hits it, you form something new. So for example... 
one experiment we're planning to do next year is to get a neon beam. So neon is something you've all heard of and make it hit a gas of hydrogen. So that's made of one proton. So once it hits it, it captures that proton and it becomes a whole new element, which will be sodium, which also you might know from salt. So salt is made of sodium. So these are all elements we've heard of, but we're working with the nucleus. And then just to remind our listeners one more time, what is the difference between an atom and the nucleus? So the nucleus is just the inner part of the atom without the outside electrons. So the actual nucleus is like 100,000 times smaller than the overall atom. And if you remember, like we used to draw like the middle of the, the nucleus as a dot with like the electrons outside of it as like a certain structure kind of looks like the solar system, if you will. So we strip these atoms of all the um, electrons and we work with only the nucleus that is just made up of protons and neutrons. Sometimes they do have electrons and then the atom will have a different charge depending on what we're transmitting. This might be a little too technical, but it, it is important for the different experiments that we're doing to know how many electrons this atom still has. Thank you so much, Sarah, for giving us that little bit of insight about what's going on at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory. Can you tell us a little bit about what SACAR is doing with these capture reactions and why we're measuring them in the first place? Yeah, so SACAR is, like I mentioned in the name, it's called the Separator for Capture Reactions in Astrophysics. So we are mostly interested in studying reactions that are important for stellar explosions like supernovae, X-ray bursts, and novae. How do the reactions that you observe relate to astrophysics? All of these explosions that we see in the sky are actually powered by nuclear physics. So you know that the star, the stars in, for example, our sun is powered by nuclear reactions happening in its core. So we know that other explosions such as X-ray bursts and supernovae are happening because these nuclear reactions eventually either run out of fuel or they go into a thermonuclear runaway and you see these bright bursts of, of light in the sky. Are there any particular stellar explosions that your research will be applicable towards? Yeah, so SICAR is designed to study nuclear reactions that power X-ray bursts. So where an X-ray burst is a burst of X-rays coming from the explosion that happens when you have a neutron star orbiting a star like our sun. So the neutron star is a star made of neutrons that is very, very dense and very, very heavy. So it has a very strong gravity that attracts things around it. So when it's orbiting a star like our sun, it starts to absorb or sort of attract the gas to it. And once that gas piles up on the surface of the neutron star because of all the the high temperature and the pressure, it starts forming, it's, this gas is actually very rich in hydrogen, so they start fusing into helium. And eventually, once it reaches a critical mass, it ignites this explosion all over the surface of the neutron star, and it creates this burst of X-rays that we see from um, with our telescopes in the atmosphere, outside of the atmosphere, actually, because X-ray bursts cannot go through the Earth's atmosphere. That was a stellar explanation. How does what SACAR does explain what's going on in X-ray bursts? So I don't know if you guys have interviewed astronomers previously in this show, but you should if you haven't, because then you'll get the other side of it. So what they do is they build models to explain the things that they see in the universe. So they might observe a certain X-ray burst in some direction, another gamma ray burst in another direction, but not know where it's from. And so they spend their time trying to figure out what it's coming from. And it's kind of between astrophysics and astronomy and nuclear astrophysics is when we build models on the computer to try to actually build a star on this computer and see what is happening with these nuclear reactions. But to have to have a model be actually accurate and tell you what is actually going on, you have to give it the correct inputs. And those inputs are not always known. And what SICAR will be doing is getting more accurate measurements of what is actually going on with these nuclear reactions. So like the actual real, or I should say a more precise reaction rate for the relevant reactions for X-ray bursts to be used as inputs in these models. So once we have more precise and accurate inputs, we can actually learn about X-ray bursts through these models that we're building. So SACAR is going to help astrophysicists figure out what these inputs are and help constrain their nuclear astrophysical models. That's correct. To remind some of our listeners that are tuning in, what is your thesis about? 
So I'm focusing right now on building and testing SACAR. It's not functional yet for science measurements to like to actually measure these reaction rates. So what I'm doing right now is commissioning each and every part of it. And it's actually a very large system. It is made up of 27 magnets and two large velocity filters. So let me explain a little bit how these work and why we need them. So like I said, you have a sort of like laser beam going through these beam lines and we're making it hit a target made of, let's say, hydrogen gas, and it's capturing something. But the way we do that is we have this these particles go through these beam lines by bending them using magnets. So imagine how when you're trying to put a magnet up on the fridge, it kind of is attracted to the fridge because that's how the magnetic force works. So in the same way, these particles going through the beam line feel the magnetic forces from these magnets, and depending on how you set the magnets, you can make it go left or right or up or down. And that is what we're doing with SACAR. Through these 27 magnets, we are able to refine our beam and make sure that the only parts we're interested in, which are the products from the nuclear reaction that we just measured, to go through certain selections so that we don't see any noise from different things that might have happened along the beam line, and that so that we can eventually get the products to the end of SACAR where we have detectors that will measure specifically the products that will tell us exactly how much of, let's say, sodium was produced. Cool. So you've been involved with the development from the beginning, it sounds like. Sort of, yeah. Um, I started this project when they were just starting to receive shipments of these magnets, and so that's when I started testing them, and I saw it from come from the ground up. So then what is the current status of SACAR as of today? As of today, the first part of SACAR is fully functional. We have successfully tested it with actual particles of like beam particles going through it, and we made sure that it behaves the way we expect it to. And the next part is to commission the rest of it. So that's about like, I would say almost half of it. And hopefully next year we will be doing actual measurements of these nuclear reactions and just kind of prove that this concept actually works and we can measure them. It's really admirable that you've been around SACAR since basically the beginning and good luck towards the future of him. Now, it seems like you spend a lot of time in the lab, but what do you like to do outside of the lab? Most of my time is spent on outdoor activities. Now, I know in Michigan that doesn't mean much because I don't really like snow, but I've been trying to make effort. So I mostly like to go camping and hiking, and I've been getting into backpacking recently. Are you a part of any organizations here on campus? Actually, my first two years, I was a part of the MSU Outdoors Club, which um, is mostly undergrads. Out of like 450-some students, we were like two graduate students. But it's kind of a shame because it is actually a great resource when you just move here and you don't know anybody. You can take trips with them, and that's how I kind of got started in Michigan. What has been your favorite place to have visited here while you're in Michigan? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I have two favorite places, actually. So I really like Pictured Rocks. Um, it's all the way in the UP. Another one in the Lower Peninsula that I really liked is actually Beaver Island. I really like the beaches there, especially on the side towards the land here. It's really beautiful water and just very calm. I'm curious, what got you into nuclear science in the first place? What actually got me into nuclear science was astronomy. I actually did not take any nuclear physics classes in undergrad. And when I started my physics degree in undergrad, it was mostly to be an astronomer. But then I realized that um, I'm more interested in what's actually happening in the stars than I am in observing them. And I actually didn't know that nuclear astrophysics was a thing. But then looking through grad schools, I saw the, the program here and all the stuff they have. And I was like, this is a really cool place. And that's how I just... It's kind of a spontaneous decision decision to move to nuclear astrophysics. When you were younger, before you went into astronomy, did you always know that you wanted to basically observe stars? Funnily, yes, I kind of did. So it's a, I was like the one year old that memorized all the names of the planets in the solar system, and I went to my first observatory when I was four years old. So I was I had my first astronomy book when I was four. So it was um, pretty much something I knew I loved and wanted to do, and I'm really lucky that I got to pursue that. Since you were one year old, you knew that you liked astronomy, and I think that's so awesome. But you switched your career path a little. You went from astronomy now to nuclear astrophysics. 
Do you have an idea of what you want to do when you graduate? Yeah, so I figured out through working on this project that I really like hands-on work, and I'm now starting to actually kind of write the codes that we will do to analyze that we will use to analyze all the data that we will get. And I'm also figuring out that I like, you know, software engineering and all that type of stuff. So I am considering branching out and seeing what opportunities there are in data science related fields where I can use everything that I've learned working on science to solve like real world applications that can help society and make an impact. It's interesting to me that you talk about data science because I like to learn programming for fun. I, I know that sounds kind of nerdy, but it's just cool to learn different things, honestly. And I had that same kind of problem, you know, like wondering what am I going to do because there's so many options out there. What advice do you wish that someone gave you as a young Sarah in high school before you were going into college and thinking about going into astronomy or nuclear astrophysics? I wish someone had told me to start programming earlier, honestly. <laughs> it's great that you do it for fun, and we barely got exposure to it in high school and even in undergrad, and I think that nowadays this is a really important thing to be able to master for really any field that you go into, and the earlier you start, the easier it becomes. Thanks so much for sharing that incredible research with us, Sarah. I know you got a really busy schedule, and it really means to, a lot to us as well as our listeners to hear about the day in the life of Sarah Ayub. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on SciFiles.